Welcome back. It's another episode of Unqualified Opinions. I'm Ryan Selkis, at 2 Bit Idiot, and uh, really excited to chat with someone that I met six years ago uh, in the crypto scene, uh, and I've worked with in a, in a couple of different capacities now, uh, Daniel Vogel, who is the CEO um, at Bitso, the one of the largest, the largest or one of the largest um, Bitcoin uh, exchanges in Mexico and, and one of the largest uh, remittance companies now uh, in Mexico. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, the Latin American scene because they're expanding beyond just Mexico as well, um, or have already expanded. So we'll, we'll talk about the, the scene more generally speaking um, in the Western Hemisphere, not named uh, the U.S., and uh, of course, want to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about one of my favorite subjects, XRP. But a spoiler alert uh, for the fans that are playing along: uh, this is actually going to be, a, I think, a relatively bullish and and positive discussion on, on XRP. Um, and it's because uh, the Bitso team is generally leveraging the the XRP ledger and, and the remittance system as designed, not necessarily as a speculative store of value, but, but certainly uh, kind of going to go into the inner workings of, of how that relationship has been uh, panning out and, and in particular, um, why it's so important given Bitso's uh, position, not just in crypto remittances, but, but driving a meaningful percentage of overall uh, volume now through that uh, primary remittance corridor between the U.S. and Mexico. So there, there's a ton that we're going to cover. Uh, I'm so excited to catch up with you. It's been too long. Um, but, uh, but Daniel, why don't we, I like to start by just giving the origin stories for, uh, the folks that got into the industry and kind of how they, you know, fell down the rabbit hole and, and yours is, is interesting. And also, um, I, I love it because you and I were in kind of very similar spots, right? I, I was coming into the industry full time, had skipped business school because, you know, I, I basically fell into Bitcoin and decided to defer. And um, you and I got to know each other a little bit in Boston because you were at HBS. So, um, so talk, talk a little bit about the the just high level journey. You know what you did before, and, and then you know how you came to join Bitso. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Ryan, for the kind intro. It's great to be here. It's great to to connect with you again. And you've been a very important part of our journey at Bitso. And so, love speaking to you. And 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 yeah, so I the story is so I'm originally from Mexico. I spent ten years in the states. I, I went to undergrad there. I studied computer systems engineering and economics. And then I was working in, in the valley in uh, in a company called Quantcast, doing sort of like programmatic ad buying. And my neighbor, who went to school with me, and a, and a really good friend, one day just basically said, "Have you listened to this thing? This crazy thing called Bitcoin?" And I said, "No." And I remember we were rum tasting because um, he had another roommate who was a big fan of rum. And I went back home and I started just going into the internet and just reading about Bitcoin. And the next thing I realized it was like 6 a.m. in the morning and the sun was up. And I spent like four or five hours just browsing and falling deeply on the, on the rabbit hole. I then became known as the Bitcoin guy at the at Quantcast because um, that was one of the few things that I would talk about. You know, it was very early on. And then, and then I left my job to pursue an MBA at HVS in 2013. And, and, and when I, what I found when I was at the at base coast was very different, right? Like, very, especially at HVS, nobody really talked about Bitcoin. There were, at that point, there were no cases about Bitcoin. Um, but there was like a, this little community that you were part of. And, you know, you had Circle, who was sort of like starting up at that point. And to be very honest, at that time, I was sort of like just connecting with folks, not thinking I was going to be, build a business, but mainly because I was just very interested in the technology. And ever since the onset, and I'll say this now because it'll, it'll sort of connect back with the story, but since the onset, I was always very interested in remittances because as a Mexican living in the U.S., I had experienced how difficult it is to move money from the U.S. to Mexico. And, you know, I didn't, luckily I didn't have a necessity to send money back home like many other Mexicans do, but I had the chance to meet many of them in the 10 years that I spent in the States. And, and it's a little bit of a heartbreaking story to know the amount of money that these folks pay uh, to do like a very, very simple service that I thought Bitcoin was going to solve, right? But I, I, I was very bullish on the idea that a digital currency could basically completely kill those, uh, those costs, those transfer costs. 
And um, and then along the way, when I was at, when I was in business school, I connected with these two amazing guys who were basically starting a, a crypto exchange in Mexico, a Bitcoin exchange in Mexico, because really Bitcoin was the, the only relevant currency back then. And well, maybe for some of your audience, it, it still is. But um, but we basically they were basically starting this Bitcoin exchange, and I and I started helping them out. And and slowly, I, I I got really curious, and they propositioned that I join them as a co-founder, and, and and we started what became Bitso. And it's been it's been quite some time now. The the the, the service started in in April of 2014, so we're coming up to our sixth year. It makes us one of the oldest uh, Bitcoin exchanges to remain alive, and we are the largest one in Mexico by a significant margin. And in, in the rest of the town, sometimes we're the largest one, and sometimes we battle it with some exchanges in Brazil, but with a very big focus to continue to um, you know, be a big voice and, a big, and, and an important player in getting more people on board on, on, on crypto, and, and basically with a very big focus on building very seamless and good on-ramps for, for folks that uh, live in jurisdictions that are not as well connected as some of the as some of the jurisdictions that your that your audience primarily uh, is at you know, and has experience. Which countries are you available in now? So we're fully available in Mexico, and that is by far our largest market. Mm-hmm. And we just launched um, we just launched a beta in Argentina, which should mm-hmm. become a full blown experience uh, starting next month. And we have a team in Brazil that is uh, actively looking into Brazil. It's an it's a interesting jurisdiction because uh, it's a very, very large market. It's the largest economy in, in Latin America. But then one of the things that we're doing sort of on the side is how do we, how, how can we accelerate access to folks that live in other jurisdictions in LATAM that don't necessarily, where we don't necessarily need to deploy a full solution like we have in, in Mexico and Argentina, where it's basically a full, full on-ramp and full off-ramp, very well connected to the financial realities of those folks with very strong uh, banking integrations. Uh, in Mexico, we have access to a real-time growth settlement payment provider that allows us to basically uh, go to and from a bank account in seconds. And, and in Argentina, we do the same thing. In Mexico, it's 24-7. In Argentina, the banking system doesn't operate 24-7 yet, but it's going to get there. And, and, and so we, we've built these very, very good integrations in those two countries. And next one is Brazil. But at the same time, we're exploring how can we provide uh, a lot more access more quickly with not as good as an, an integration, but at least allowing some of the folks that want to have access to have access uh, quicker. Yeah, and and you know when we you know when I was at Digital Currency Group, that's that's how we really got to know each other because DCG was one of the seed investors in Bitso, um, and you know back then to your point, it was all about Bitcoin. So the the um, the service offering was quite different, right? So uh, now it seems the exchanges are are more or less focusing on asset coverage, or they went through a phase where they were focusing on on broadening their asset coverage and, and the number of assets that they supported. Um, and now it's starting to revert back a little bit because we're in this kind of fallow period between cycles um, and volumes are low on some of the, you know, all these assets that they scramble to support. So now we're getting back into like multi-service uh, offerings. You know, st- you got your custody, you got staking, you got lending, you got margin and option. Like um, in, uh, in 2015, you know, when we were talking with, with Bitso, it was really about all types of services around Bitcoin in particular, right? So, you know, the on-ramps, the trading environments, um, the, you know, ultimate, you know, spendability, you know, was, was, was very important as well. You know, what kind of merchant adoption looked like was important. Um, but it, it seems that um, you have, have kind of taken a middle ground right now in uh, you have maybe 10 assets that are covered. So the major ones for sure, but still a, a relatively tight focus on, on being, and on ramp uh, in particular, um, what what are some of the challenges, um, or, or, or you know, why does it make sense for you to kind of own the customer relationship end to end versus just becoming like the the, the liquidity source for Latin America? Because it's it's an interesting dynamic with the Latin American exchanges and wallets. It, it seems like 
no one really has fully captured all of that international, you know, Southern hemisphere liquidity and, and created like the winning um, exchange and, and, you know, with, with kind of mega volumes in the, in the region. Um, and no one is, has dominated on the wallet or custody side either. It's like everybody's got their own little fiefdoms and that they're all uh, competing around the same parts of the stack. So, so how do you strategically speaking, you know, first of all, do you think that's accurate? And then um, second of all, um, how much of that is driven by just different behaviors from the users in Latin America, um, from you know a user in the U.S. And, or another emerging market that might have a more speculative uh, Wild West mindset like China or or Korea, where you know uh, the the propensity to gamble and and kind of throw money down at the roulette table uh, might be quite a bit higher than the folks that are looking at this uh, from a, a, a more of a pure utility standpoint in many cases. It's a really good. Question. I would say, like, if you look at, for example, savings, right, like the amount of savings in a country like Mexico compared to um, the amount of savings in a country like, like the United States, like there's a lot more disposable income floating in, in a place like, you know, place like Europe, and Asia, and the U.S., than in a lot of places in Latin America. And so speculation it absolutely happens. But it's, I, I think it's hard to build a business on speculation in the U.S., but it becomes even harder to build a business based purely on speculation in regions of the world where you don't actually have a lot of money going around to speculate, right? Mm -hmm. And where the folks that actually have a ton of money to speculate, you know, because, you know, Mexico is, uh, you know, we have the third or sometimes second, sometimes first, depending on what your richest man in the world. Um, you, you know, you have you have a number of individuals that are ultra rich, but mm -hmm. they, you know, they a lot of their money is not sitting in Mexico. They prefer dealing in accounts uh, offshore, so they're you're not even like their their customer either, right? So you're sort of like in this in between place um, when when you're serving Latin America. But there's a ton of need from people in the region to have access to better financial services, like just a ton of them. When we were in 2016, right after DCG made their, their, their initial investment, we considered pivoting from being an exchange to being a payment service provider for online gamers, because it was the year that like Steam started to act to um, accept Bitcoin payments for, for their online gaming platform. And basically all of our growth in 2016 were like young males who, young male adults who basically didn't have access to a credit card or a bank. And we had built this integration where you could go to like a convenience store and put money that you turn into crypto and make a payment. And, um, and our users didn't even understand what Bitcoin was, but they had a need, right? Like they had a thing mm -hmm. that they needed to solve. Unfortunately, rising fees in the Bitcoin blockchain made that, that complete use case basically just disappear because at some point, you know, making that Bitcoin transaction was more than the amount of money that, that the user wanted to actually top up on Steam and then Steam ended up taking uh, Bitcoin payments away from the platform. So it's kind of like a sad thing for us because we, we, we've seen a lot of traction. But I just say this to, to, to exemplify the need that you have in a place like, 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 like Latin America, right? Like if you just take the example of Mexico alone, you have 120 some million people, let's say 125 million individuals who live in the country. You have over 100 million cell phone lines. Out of those 100 million, I think the last estimate I read is that over 87 million of those are already connected on smartphones. So these are internet enabled devices. And yet you basically have under 40 million bank accounts in the country. And about 22 million of those bank accounts are bank accounts that, that people don't use, where basically uh, your employer pays you in the bank account. And then uh, in Mexico, you get paid um, every 15 days. Basically, the day, of the, 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 the day that the money is paid, you see these huge lines in ATMs around the whole entire country. Because the minute the minute the money arrives in a bank account, people basically take it all out and then use cash, right? And cash, we, we, we've spoken at length in the industry about, you know, cash is uh, insecure, it's inconvenient, like all, all these problems that cash, have, uh, cash has. And, um, and, and, you, and, and we think that you have a real opportunity in, these, in, in this section of in this part of the world to basically like leapfrog a number of, of technologies, right? And, and service providers, if you want to call banks service providers. 
Um, and, and, and so today, like what, we, what we're seeing are both businesses and individuals who basically utilize crypto for something, right? A, a bunch of that is speculation, but a lot of that is not speculation. And one of the things that we track, um, you know, month over month is like the number of payments that go in and out of our platform. Like how many payments are people, how many payments are customers doing on the platform? And, and one of the things that I absolutely love is that for almost every other metric, like if you look at volume, if you look at revenue, whatever, like, you sort of follow very closely the, um, the, the Bitcoin price, right? Like there's a lot more volume when the, the prices are higher, speculation is higher, etc. But like when you look at things like payments or like the amount of money that is flowing in and out in Mexican pesos um, mm -hmm. from, from Bitso, like we, we, we've basically seen growth for the last like, you know, six years. You know? And every year we've had more growth than the, than the, than the year prior. Which is not which is not the case for volume, right? Um, and, and and this is just because. Are you, are, are you talking about revenue growth? No, I'm talking about just number of payments on the platform. So one of the oh, okay. things that we've built, one of the things that we've built. I was going to say, I was going to say that that almost seems impossible. But, but no, no, no. no. I was going to congratulate you, but <laughs> <laughs> um, the only no. recession resistant company in the entire. No, 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 not at all. Um, no, but like, so for example, if, if you're a customer of Coinbase and you have uh, dollars in your Coinbase account, you can't send those dollars to, to like a third party, right? Like you, you basically, we draw that to your bank account and then you send that money using your bank to somebody else. Um, with the partnerships that we've built and the regulatory, the regulatory strategy that we followed as a, as a group, we actually can make payments to third parties. So someone who receives... Um, payment in crypto, for example, a freelancer that receives a payment in crypto on their Bitso account and turns it into pesos can basically then use that to uh, pay the rent. They can use that to pay uh, their internet, pay that utilities, uh, pay a friend, etc. on the platform. And, um, and the number of payments have grown. And so this has been a very big focus for us, especially in the last like year and a half is how do we actually build a business that is not completely uh, subject like susceptible to these huge uh, crypto weather, right? Where, where basically when crypto is doing really, really well, um, you're doing really, really well, but if, like, but if crypto is doing bad in terms of price, you're doing really poorly. And if you actually track the volume of Bitso, like the, the, the swings in volume of Bitso over the last, you know, like uh, let's say 24 months since, since we had um, the, the peaks in, in January of 2018, our volume went down for sure, but especially in the last like seven months, as, as exchanges worldwide were losing volume, or many exchanges worldwide were losing money, volume, we were actually increasing our volume. Um, and this is because we've spent a long time finally building a remittance solution, uh, which you alluded to in the, in the introduction. But for, for us, this is very important because it goes back to crypto as a utility. It goes back to a business model where you don't necessarily need to depend on crypto prices increasing in order for your business to do very well. It's taking us a really, really, really long time. And we talked about remittances when you were uh, looking at this opportunity when you were at DCG. And it took us basically you know, half a decade to get to a place where we are finally capitalizing on the huge cross-border flow that exists between the U.S. and Mexico, which is about $33 billion, between 30 and $36 billion a year flows between the U.S. and Mexico. And, mm -hmm. uh, and we're finally at a place where we're starting to, like we've built a product, we've, we've built a product alongside with Ripple, and, and, and we're seeing significant amount of traction. And we see that, we believe that this is just the beginning of something, right? Like this is the beginning of, of, of something a lot more exciting and interesting. But for us as a business, it's been great because you don't depend on that crypto weather. To, and, and, and the levers that you have, you know, as an organization are things that you can actually control as opposed to one of the most frustrating things about building an exchange is that you don't have those levers, right? Like sure. if the crypto price just starts going down, you don't have anything to pull. You may spend whatever you want to spend on marketing, but, um, but if those prices continue to decline, it's going to be very, very hard to bring those volumes back. And if there's no volatility, it's, it's sort of difficult. 
Where, so where, where are you now as a business, right? We're, we're in a, a little bit of a lower volatility, lower volume phase, um, certainly compared to the highs, much, much larger than, than years ago. And you're in more jurisdictions now. So I'm sure that's still a stable business. But how, uh, when it comes to your growth, how much emphasis is spent on this remittance play versus the core exchange? Because in some respects, yes, you have to continue to invest in, in the tech and support and speed and asset coverage and um, you know, regulatory compliance and, and all that. But once you've built it and once you've kind of established the position that you have, like you have in, in uh, Mexico in particular, that business, in some respects, it kind of runs on autopilot until the next spike in user growth. And then you're like, oh, here are all the things that are broken with our infrastructure that we need to reinvest in for like the next like stepwise function. Um, but to your point, the, the here and now, you, you can focus on this remittance play. Uh, that that number that was floated, the 2.5% of the remittance quarter, it seems impossibly high. Um, and And so... Uh, and, and obviously, I believe you. So that, that's like the tension that we're caught between right now. So how, walk me through um, this particular product. So first of all, like how, how this partnership came to fruition um, and how these transfers work on either end of the quarter because you've got these strong ties in Mexico, but you've still got to get the sender on board so that they can send you know, US dollars or, you know, via XRP or via Bitcoin, or whatever it is. Um, and, and and that's a little bit less clear. So, so maybe you can elaborate on, uh, and maybe that's where Ripple comes in or, or some of the other US-based exchanges come in. Um, let, let's, yeah. let's kind of dive in there. Yeah. So um, this came about for a really long time. You know, like we, we've invested over the years a significant amount of time at Bitso in trying to figure out cross-border transactions. We've attended for years something called the International Money Transmitter Conferences, which happen in Miami most of the time, um, but in other places in the world. And you're just trying to understand sort of the, like the money transmission piece. Mm -hmm. And we've done that for a number of years, right? And we've built experiments and trials, and, um, and, and we actually have a, a working product that works on top of Bitcoin. That um, that has worked for the last two years, but we never really had um, like a lot of growth and a lot of like um, traction. At the same time, since the beginning of Bitso, so the, the, so we the first thing we added in Bitso was a way to trade Bitcoin uh, with Mexican pesos, right? So that was sort of like first feature was a vanilla uh, exchange where you could fund Mexican pesos, fund Bitcoin, and people could trade uh, with each other. One of the very first thing, very very first things we did after that was we became what at the what at that time um, was called an, uh, a Ripple gateway. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know this, but Ripple has supported the issuance of assets on top of the Ripple ledger for a really long time. Sort of like the same way that you can now issue assets on top of the Ethereum ledger, and you have things like you know. A tether and true USD and whatnot, um, you, 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 you actually were able to do that on, on the Ripple Ledger for a really long time. And we, and, and, and but you, you're trying to, well, you, yeah. you, still, you still can, right? You, can, you still can. Yeah, right? can. yeah. I mean, so, so and this, this uh, I don't want to, you know, get totally sidetracked, but, but this kind of comes down to like, how, how do you actually use XRP um, versus just like the Ripple Ledger, which happens to have this one asset XRP. So I'm, I know we're going to get there, but but uh, for, for clarity's sake, you still can. And to your point, the, the ledger was initially designed to support any digitized asset so that you could move it you know, across uh, this ledger more, more, more quickly. Yes. Um, and and, and we're, we were a Ripple gateway at the, at, you know, in the very beginning of Bitso and, you, and we had Bitso MXN in the Ripple ledger as an asset and we had Bitso BTC as a, as a ledger, as a, an, an asset on the ledger. Um, and then at some point we decided to close that because it was difficult to maintain for us and we basically saw no customer traction whatsoever, whereas mm -hmm. things like Bitcoin were getting a ton of traction, a lot of interest, et cetera, et cetera. In 2016, uh, we added uh, Ether. We were one of the first global exchanges to add Ether. And, and, and we started to sort of see the similar set of interest in Ethereum that we're seeing sort of in Bitcoin, you know, like 
communities were developing, etc. And we didn't really see that with a Ripple gateway. So we decided to, to, to basically um, sunset support for our, uh, for our Ripple gateway. And then, and then Ripple came to us and said, hey, what about like listing XRP? We have, we have this idea that we basically want to use the XRP asset as sort of like a peg currency. And we believe that there are these big problems that money transmitters have and that, you know, the correspondent banking have. And we want to build, we want to build a solution that utilizes the XRP, the, the Ripple ledger um, and XRP to solve some of these issues. And we were like, oh, that's interesting. So we listed, uh, this is this is uh, May 2017. So, you know, like you started to get this hype on crypto. And so it kind of made sense to start adding new new items as an exchange mm -hmm. uh, with your prior questions. But we're like, okay, let's add this new asset. Let's add XRP. And we were actually were met with a lot of demand. We didn't advertise it. We didn't send a single email. And basically, the launch of the XRP uh, market on our exchange basically like brought down. It was the first time that we that Bitso was brought down by the man. Um, to your prior point, starting to figure out what were the things that we needed to fix. Um, <laughs> well, that was right around then, the time. That was right around the time that XRP in particular was going vertical. Exactly. Like, so four, XRP 40, started, like 40, 40 X growth or something crazy like that during during May of twenty seventeen. Exactly. So we sort of like by accident timed it, uh, launched it, saw a lot of demand. There was big price increases, uh, sort of a little craziness. Website went down, whatnot. Um, and then in two thousand, and, 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 and the way that sort of Ripple pitched this to us was, look, we have this very ambitious plan to build something called at that point was called X Rapid. Now it's called ODL which was to move money cross-border utilizing XRP. And we we're going to use exchanges on different jurisdictions to basically be the place in which the fiat currencies get turned into crypto or XRP or the XRP gets turned into a fiat currency. Um, and we were, to be very honest, we were a little bit skeptical at the time. We're like, well, that sounds great, but like, you know, XRP doesn't have any liquidity around the world. You know, XRP, you know, like it's the, we've tried to do this with Bitcoin. It's been very, very difficult to get money transmitters on board, um, et cetera. And then in 2018, about a year after we listed XRP on the ledger, on, on, on Bitso, uh, Ripple came to us and said, hey, we're, we really are building this thing. Um, and we would like for Bitso to be one of the partners to, to launch this. And they basically presented with a, with a very interesting plan or what we thought was a very interesting plan that, um, you know, where a lot of the questions and a lot of the comments that we made priorly and a lot of our concerns were sort of addressed. And we took a chance on it, right? Like, because it required us to build some stuff. Uh, it, was some, it was stuff that made our exchange stronger. Um, so basically, they wanted better APIs, and so we also took it as an opportunity to make our APIs more robust and add more functionality that we thought could be beneficial for other customers. But we basically started adding all these things in, and um, and at the end of 2018, at the very end, and I remember this because uh, we actually were a customer of the product ourselves, in December of 2018, we started doing the first Again, back then, X Rapid now ODL transactions, and 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 it was very primitive, right? Like I I, I sort of felt a little bit like when I was uh, playing with Bitcoin the first time, and it was like on a terminal, and it's like not a, not a night. There was no UI, whatnot. So we're making these payments, and the flow of the payment is the following: so you fund an exchange, uh, let's say in uh, in Europe. And let's say that you have euros at an exchange in Europe that has an XRP euro market. And then basically, uh, Ripple's built software that can read the order book in the European exchange, can read the order book uh, at Bitso, let's say. And it basically gives you an exchange rate. And it tells you, look, if you buy XRP in this moment and send it to Bitso and then convert it back to pesos, you're going to get an FX between euros and pesos uh, that, uh, of a certain amount. And then you decided whether you wanted to do whether you wanted to do the transaction. So we did a few transactions, moving uh, part of our own treasury money um, that we kept at this other exchange, and um, it was kind of cool, but it was kind of like difficult. We gave uh, Ripple a little bit of feedback. We said, you know, the, the, 
uh, our engineering teams are not the one moving the money. It's our finance team, our treasury team. So like, in order for them to use it, you need to build U uh, UIs. And then they went and, and built these UIs. And then we were a customer of the UIs ourselves. And we continue to actually be customers of, um, of this product. Um, and, 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 and at some point, um, basically, we started talking to very large uh, money transmitters. The one that I can speak about publicly, because there's some other story uh, that's been public about it, is MoneyGram. And MoneyGram is actually, you know, if you go into their last earnings call, they specifically talked about um, utilizing the XRP ledger to, to basically do these transactions. But the flow is basically the same. They, they basically pre-fund an account in the United States um, with US dollars. And they, whenever they want to move money to Mexico, they basically convert dollars to XRP, move the XRP over to Bitso, and then convert that XRP over to Pesos. And, um, and then you withdraw those funds. You know? So you're on the other side of most of the money ground flow now. Exactly. So we well not Bitso wow. specifically, but the customers of Bitso that make up our market, right? Like our exchange. At, at the end of the day, what we've built is a platform that intermediates buyers and sellers, just like uh, Coinbase Pro, like a Bitstamp. And so we we have customers that take the other side of the flow that MoneyGram and and and, and there's a, a fair amount of other uh, players using uh, ODL at different mm -hmm. levels, right? Like, um, uh, you know, MoneyGram is one of them, but there's various other, other players uh, with different lines of businesses that, um, and business models that are now using the, this solution to move money, to move money abroad. And, and it was kind of like smartly done because in, 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 the, in the year and a half before volume really started, so like between May or in the two years, I guess, in between May 2017 and like, you know, July 2019, where we started to see more traction on, on this ODL stuff, uh, the liquidity of XRP at Bitso has significantly increased. Um, and, and we've also always thought about this as a little bit of like liquidity is a little bit of a chicken and egg problem. Like nobody wants to market make if there's no volume and nobody wants to send transactions if there's no uh, liquidity. But, um, but Ripple's done a really good job at sort of like rolling this out slowly and steadily and, 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 and we've been building this sort of market, at least on our side, very organically and, and, and adding liquidity to XRP on our platform. And, and we're starting to see really interesting flows. And then the, the two and a half number that you've read, um, so we did not capture two and a half percent of all the remittances that were sent to Mexico in 2019 from the US. What we captured is, and I'll be very, very clear on that, is if you basically take the entire flow of money, right, like the 33 billion, and then you divide that equally uh, on a week by week basis. So you basically divide that by the, the, the 52 weeks of the year. Mm -hmm. um, and you look at the money that we transferred uh, in the last week of the year, which was the busiest week for us in the new product, that basically was two and a half percent of the total money. So it was two and a half percent of the of, 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 of sort of the money that was sent to Mexico in a week, if that makes sense. And that number has since grown. So the, 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 we did about um, we did about eighteen million dollars in volume from the, these sort of transactions on the last week of December. Um, and, 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 and we're well above that now already. And, and, and this is a volume that has been growing between 10 and 20% uh, week by week. I would say actually between like 15 and 20% uh, week by week. And, um, and it has continued to grow since that, uh, since you saw that number. Mm -hmm. That's, um, I mean, it's phenomenal growth. So, you know, by the end of uh, this year, I think you'd set out to have a target of, uh, uh, was it north of 10%? Well, there was some like shock number that I saw. So the, the, the total kind of remittance volume, you think out of that $33 billion quarter, you think you could take about what, what, what percentage or what total amount this year? So again, using, using that weekly uh, metric, 
Uh, mm -hmm. Instead of sort of like the entire year, which is what we're tracking is that weekly volume of remittances. Well, it's running, our, right? yeah. Right. Our, our, our stretch goal, like the stretch goal that I have set for the company is that we get to 20% of the weekly remittances um, by the end of 2020. It's, it's a stretch goal for us. Um, there's, you know, as you continue to scale these things, you find more and more things that break which is also sort of uh, exciting for us. Like uh, the, the product and the platform is getting better through the growth of this product because we're handling, um, you know, new types of transactions uh, in an ongoing basis that require us to, to get better at operations, get better at uh, handling uh, a, a, a number of different things. But, but that's where I would like the company to get to. Does that eclipse the exchange business then by the end of the year if you hit those numbers? It, it's got to. Well, this is where I'll turn around the, the, the question to you. Uh, what's <laughs> what's going to happen with the with the happening uh, in in the next few months? What are we? What what's what's your uh, well, expectation? We're, we're not we're not we're not going to speculate on price, but but your, <laughs> you, know, you you can pull levers on the remittance side. So if you are able to to you know get to that scale. Um, it seems like it, it, it would have to become the, the majority of the business until whatever the next kind of boom cycle is. Yes, so I, so I can tell you already that um, since we launched the exchange, um, except for very, very few, very specific days, Bitcoin had always, Bitcoin, Mexican pesos had always been our largest trading pair, and that has flipped for us now. Uh, so I noticed, our, I noticed that. Our XRP MXM book is consistently trading higher than our Bitcoin MXM book. And that's been the case already for the last, I believe, I actually have the graph here, I'm not going to pull it up, but, um, but I believe that's been already the case for at least the last eight weeks. Um, you, this has got to be one of the uh, bigger success stories for, for Ripple. Uh, in terms of integrations, is it not? Uh, because, you know, you, you, I, I generally think that the criticism of, of Ripple, the company, um, and I've not been shy about mine, has, has been the delta between what they market and what they deliver, right? Particularly when it comes to XRP flows. Um, what's interesting about Bitso is that you are a crypto exchange. So there's no dancing around the, the subject. It, it, having... Um, a meaningful XRP stake and actually using that asset is much more intuitive than, say, having, you know, XRP incorporated into MoneyGram, uh, which really took a, a pretty large capital infusion from Ripple to directly into MoneyGram to pull off. So, um, I mean, did you just learn this, uh, you know, kind of trial by error and, and kind of making a leap with, with Ripple or, or are there other case studies that give you similar comfort uh, that, that this you know, could be a, a greater trend than just the U.S.-Mexico corridor with this particular application? Yeah, um, so I can, I can tell you already that there are other flows uh, that are not only the, the U.S. to Mexico. And um, so I can tell you a few things. Number one, I can tell you that not all the customers that we've been onboarding are money transmitters, like MoneyGram, mm -hmm. right? So, like, mm -hmm. there's other types of businesses that have a necessity to move money abroad and cross-border and want to do it quickly and at a good rate that are becoming interested in this solution mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and, 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 and that have already transacted on the platform. So, we already see those volumes. The... I can tell you that not all of them are, like not all the flows that we're seeing are only U.S. to Mexico. Like we're starting to see things from other parts of, uh, like other jurisdictions. Um, mm -hmm. I, I can tell you for sure that, you know, the, the biggest flow and the biggest type of customer up to now is definitely the U.S. to Mexico and it is definitely money transmitters like MoneyGram, right? Mm -hmm. Um we we've built like we we had a we've had a cross border team at Bitso since 2016 and like well before we started exploring this possibility with ripple mm -hmm. and as i mentioned before we had a or we have a product where, that allows you to do something similar with bitcoin i do have to say 
that the product that we've built in conjunction with Ripple is a lot better than anything we had built before. It has, uh, it's more intuitive, it has a nicer UI, it understands the customer pain points better. Um, uh, you know, the, the fact that XRP settles very quickly and that Bitcoin takes a long time to settle um, when, you, when what you're looking to do is reduce sort of like uh, volatility exposure, is, is, is a big pro of utilizing XRP over utilizing uh, Bitcoin for these, for these sort of transactions. Um, why, why XRP though? So, so this is the question that, that um, I kind of always came back to because the ledger can do 90% of what I think is, is you know, advertised and, and what you've already built in conjunction with them. And now you've got the introduction of stable coins, some of which you support, right? You've got true USD on the platform, at least. Maybe there are others that, that I miss, but I knew, know that at least true USD is there. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, in a, in a universe where stable coins become the norm, right? Do, dollar pegged, basket pegs, you know, whatever they're pegged to, where liquidity for those assets increases. Um, and you can still leverage the same kind of base protocols, um, but the, the, now the bridge currencies, which has always been Ripple's pitch, now the bridge currencies can just be a stable coin where you're not worried about the fluctuations. Um, it, why, why is that wrong, right? Like why, why must it be XRP or, or why is that kind of going to be the near medium term and kind of foreseeable future um, mechanism and, and, and currency leverage in this particular transaction versus something that doesn't have the volatility. Yeah, like we think about this a lot uh, ourselves. And th the way that I sort of like to frame this is that for, for me, and I think for, for most of us, technology is sort of this ever evolving um, thing, right? And w when you look at the liquidity of something like true USD and Mexican pesos at Bitso versus the liquidity of um, XRP and Mexican pesos, like there's there's no comparison, right? Like we have significantly more depth in our XRP markets than we do in our true USD markets. Mm -hmm. I simply could not uh, support the amount of volume that we're seeing in our true USD books. And as I was sort of mentioning to you, like, um, you know, we, we, we're not the other side of the trade. Uh, our customers are the other side of the, of the trade for these, for these transactions. Um, I do think that, you know, this needs to be looked at and constantly reevaluated, right? Because mm -hmm. when, when you're going through whatever, whether it's XRP, whether it's Bitcoin, whether it's Ether, whatever you want, um, you, you have sort of like an extra conversion that perhaps you don't need, right? And you, you're taking perhaps extra risk that perhaps you don't need. What I can tell you is that without a doubt, I would not be able to do these transactions. Like Pizza would not be able to do these transactions right now on any of our other, uh, in, in any of our other uh, ledgers. Like even if you wanted to use true USD, the, the settlement of, the, of, of Ether is slower than the settlement of XRP. And if we wanted to use like, uh, and, and we're not supporting like uh, an, an asset on top of, um, of XR or on top of the Ripple ledger, but um, but and but even if we wanted to, we would we would need to build up liquidity. I I do believe that as we progress, like this industry, specifically for the case of cross border, I think where we are today are the very beginnings of something incredibly exciting. Um, but I would, I, you know, I think it would be foolish to think that this is going to be the end state. I think this mm -hmm. needs to continue to evolve. And I think stable coins uh, today, uh, you know, provide an alternative thing that, you know, perhaps didn't exist at the extent that we would have liked them to exist when we started to, 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 to build this product, right? Like the only real stable coin back then was, uh, tether and, and and tether is something that is difficult to is, is a difficult on ramp has had its own sort of set of uh, I don't know what you want to call them conspiracy theories whatnot and um and 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 and, and 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 when when I look at this problem like sometimes 
sometimes it's easy to think that everything is technology. Mm -hmm. But so one of the biggest learnings that I've had over the last, uh, you know, you know, five years building this, trying to build a cross-border product with crypto is that the largest component is actually not tech. Like the largest component is convincing these highly regulated entities to do something with you, to open an account with you, to, to get comfortable with utilizing crypto. Like th those problems are a lot harder to fix, right? And uh, stable coins present um, a challenge there because you know we we start to have these new um, stable coins where the aim is to make them incredibly transparent, where there's a lot of auditing going on, where there's a lot of like you know quote unquote good people running running these projects. But for a long time, it was a very opaque thing, right? And sometimes for these players, it's incredibly difficult to assess the risk of having a large operation that depends on assets where they don't fully understand um, how they're managed and, 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 and what potential risks could there be uh, behind them. Uh, makes sense. We're, 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 we're going to get into the regulatory uh, component in one second. I just I, I want to make sure that we close the loop on the um, uh, on, on XRP. So, um, so Ripple is uh, an investor, correct? In, in yes. So was that through uh, this particular initiative or just in the company itself? Um, so, so in other words, was the... Was the Ripple is... The, the, the story with Ripple is, you know, we were building this partnership right, mm -hmm. well before looking at an investment. Um, and then Bitso started to think a little bit about investment. And um, it, we were speaking to the Ripple team. One of the things that we heard from the Ripple team is, hey, you know, we really love the way that you've run your operation. We really like the focus that you've had on sort of like regulatory clarity and, um, mm -hmm. and building operational excellency. And, we're just curious, like, are you thinking about expanding internationally? And we said, yeah, we have plans to expand internationally. We want to go into LATAM. We see a big opportunity in LATAM. And they became very excited about that, uh, that idea. And they said, is there anything we can do to help accelerate that? And then we said, look, if we want to accelerate that, we would, we would need to raise uh, a round. Um, and, and, and they became very, very interested in, in being part of that. Um, and so, and so that's how they became they became investors in the company. Now, um, did um, because you're leveraging XRP um, for the, the settlement, there, there's a bit of working capital there that's required too, right? You, even though your users are the ones on the other side of the remittance trade, right? Um, you still have some type of working capital requirements. Is is, is part of the relationship with Ripple? Um, them providing uh, cheaper access to the the bridge currency, um, or so, or is this just something that you scale up as the um, a, as the quarter expands? Yeah, so so we really don't have any working capital requirements in XRP as okay. a business. All all the transactions are really handled by other players in the exchange. In fact. Um, you know, we're, we're regulated by the, our exchange is regulated by the Gibraltar Financial Services Commission. And one of the things that's very important for, for the regulators in Gibraltar is that we, there's not like a conflict of interest. So we don't trade on our own exchange and we don't provide liquidity in, in, in our own exchange specifically to, to prevent having like conflict of interests, right? Because we, we have obviously a lot more information on what our customers are doing than, uh, than than another customer trading on the on the platform, right? And so, um, so no, the answer is absolutely not. We did we did not receive uh, we did not receive XRP and the XRP, and we don't require to have XRP as, as working capital for, for this product to be uh, to continue to grow. Um, and, and 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 no, we did not receive uh, access to cheaper XRP as part of this deal. Good, good clarification. Well, it, it's a it's a fascinating case study for for, for them, for you, um, and uh, I I certainly hope that uh, you can bring better, faster, cheaper remittances uh, through that quarter and, and hopefully throughout that M. 
Um, let's um, let's end with the sexiest topic that we can possibly imagine: um, regulation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, you, you brought it up basically as soon as we hopped on the line, um, and understandably so because you've got uh, quite a bit going on in Europe, in the U.S., and you know internationally um, with FATFA uh, and and kind of enhanced privacy uh, compliance standards. Um, how to enforce the travel rule. Uh, I know not that long ago, Mexico uh, and some of the uh, draft legislation that was written was, was borderline existential uh, in terms of whether you know, crypto would, would be um, usable or, or businesses like yours would, would be conceivable in, in Mexico City. Um, walk through that process of, of educating regulators in, in Latin America um, who I, I don't. I don't want to say. Um, I don't know that we should necessarily make a qualitative judgment like who's more informed or, or, or less informed because maybe you're not doing you know business as much business in the U.S. But um, because the the net dollar value of, of kind of crypto investment is, is much lower in Mexico, I, I, I'm not sure if there would be versus some of its peers uh, throughout the eco uh, the uh, crypto ecosystem, so like Korea and. Uh, Singapore and and Hong Kong and obviously the U.S. and, and Western Europe, like there's a lot of money there, so it's on people's radar. Um, did you did you find that the the regulators that you were engaging with were had a working knowledge of crypto uh, to start, or was this really kind of coming in and 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 saying, here is Satoshi's white paper, uh, and this is this is how a blockchain works, and 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 having to start from like the very very early innings. Um, because I can imagine um, how hard it is to do that in the U.S., given all of the different players in the ecosystem. But it kind of feels like you were on an island dealing with one uh, one government that you know you basically had to play the role of Coin Center, Coinbase, uh, Gemini, you know, like uh, all, all of the other you know kind of U.S.-based companies rolled into one. Yeah, so it's been a journey, right? And it's uh, it's something that's been also. Uh, it, it has changed significantly over time. I, I do remember 2015, some of the first meetings that I would go to, um, you know, there's a lot of education that had to take place. The, even though I'm, uh, you can sort of say that I'm dealing with one government in, in, in Mexico, it, there's actually quite a number of regulatory authorities in the country, right? Like you have the Banking and, and Securities Commission, and then you have the Ministry of Finance, and you have the Central Bank, and then you have like the a financial consumer protection agency. So you have like a bunch of different government entities that are interested in this stuff and that you need to be constantly in touch with. You know? What I can tell you is that today you have a really good knowledge about crypto. The central bank has, has a very extensive portal on their, on, on, on their official website where they specifically talk about crypto um, some of the some of the advantages that they see in the technology, some of the criticisms that they see in the technology, um, and uh, you know, almost every important financial regulatory authority in Mexico has published or said something publicly uh, on crypto in general. And so I think we're in a in a completely different world than we were in 2015, 2014 when we were starting this. But, um, but governments also change, right? And you have new folks that come into play and it's an ongoing thing that you need to do. And we, you know, th this piece of, uh, of lobbying, this piece of educating, it is something that we think, it, it's something that we need to be continue to invest, not only in Mexico, but in the region. And, um, and, and, and I would say that like the different authorities they have different, mandates and they all think about crypto different right like for example the the, the central bank is very very uh, concerned about like payment systems and and it, it, the central bank in Mexico is very concerned with like payment systems and the integrity of their payment systems and so they acknowledge that crypto post, post, uh, poses some risks for the integrity of their payment system and they want to make sure that um, players the, or companies in Mexico that are engaging with crypto and are touching their, their payment system 
um, are are well aware of the risks and are doing enough to mitigate those risks, right? And 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 that's the, I used to use the central bank as an example right now, but like every other authority, right? Like you have authorities that are more concerned with uh, money laundering and want to make sure that you're doing enough in money laundering. There's other authorities that want to make sure that you don't have low-income folks spending all their money speculating on crypto and losing all of their assets like you know the, the, you have different uh, agencies that have different concerns if we definitely see it as uh, as an ongoing thing that we will need to be continue to do as a company to to engage with them to continue to provide assurance and, and and to build a sound and good operation right like where you're addressing those risks and that's that's ultimately i think what regulators uh, care about and, and I can tell you that, like, our, 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 to call it like the dance with the regulators, our dance with the regulators has had, you know, um, all sorts of different phases. Like, you just mentioned one where there were, th th there were some legislation that was passed that was going to make it very, very difficult for a company like us to operate. But, but we've also sort of acknowledged that the, 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 the central, like, the, the, the regulatory authorities, like, see an opportunity here, right? And they, and they know that, um, that, that, that they have concerns, but they, they want to remain optimistic, I would say, on this technology. And, um, and, 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 and I think we, we're starting to see a flip, right? Like we started to talk about like central bank issued digital currencies. And, and we've had conversations with uh, regulators in Mexico who have asked us that question, like, what do you guys think about this or that, right? Um, and, and, and crypto as a tool for financial inclusion. So we've had regulators who've asked us about that and want, and, and want to explore that. And you know, one of the most exciting things that we're doing as a business is we're hoping to soon be running a, a, little, a very small trial, but a small trial in a community in Mexico um, where we're going to be working with a few government agencies to basically do a trial on, on, on seeing if we can get customers to use um, like blockchain technology to transfer value. And I say blockchain technology because we don't necessarily want to give them Bitcoin because of the volatility of Bitcoin. But what we're thinking is like a, like a tokenized asset in some way, shape or form. And, and, and the government wants to like just understand this a lot better, right? Like, ah, can, can, I can do this in a way where it's completely non-custodial and, um, and, and where customers can keep a, control of their funds and they can still transact with each other and they want to explore these things and I think that's very very important the the other thing that we've done um, as a business is you know the, the the technology can be can be difficult at times and it needs to be very properly studied and what we have found is that when we look at sort of like re legislation or regulation um, not only in Latin America, but in many other places in the world, is that you really find regulation that's been sort of like tried to be molded in a way that it fits the crypto space, where like it really, sh it, it, you really need something new. You really need something that is specific to crypto. And in the number of our. Is that, yeah. have, you, have you found because you're one of the key players that, that you know, impacts the entire Mexican uh, crypto scene, um, is it easier to have? cross-functional or cross-department or regulated discussions to, to work on this, you know, because, because yes, having a unifying regulatory standard um, that encapsulates crypto as its own thing is, is this kind of uh, hybrid fintech, uh, you know, information tech uh, stack that, that is really going to, uh, I think, lead to an explosion of new types of assets. Um, it seems like you're in, in kind of primary position and the, and the market is contained enough uh, where you could probably drive a lot of that narrative. But the, the question then just becomes urgency. So I'll let you finish, but, but uh, I, I wonder if you operating these smaller jurisdictions and, and kind of smaller sub-markets throughout LATAM uh, have an opportunity to move more quickly or to kind of push the pace where, you know, an economy the size of the US or China or, or you know, even Korea or Japan, you're you're kind of at the mercy of the government, right? You can you can consult with them, but they're gonna they're gonna do what they want, and you know, regulators gonna regulate uh, uh, depending on what their mandate is, and, and without regard for what this new structure looks like. I would say that that's still the case in uh, in, in in all these jurisdictions. Like government is still government. Um, government will still do what they want to do. 
what, what I what I what I can say is that um, like one of the big frustrations that I find when I speak to friends that are building companies or work at companies in the crypto space in these in these larger jurisdictions is that there is just such a big government machinery in some of these places that it just becomes impossible to navigate, right? Mm -hmm. And like, you know, you see places like Coin Center who are always like, oh my God, this thing came out of left field, right? Like no one knew like these senators were working on this thing or that like, you know, the UNC was building a new chapter. I'm sure some things they know and some things they don't, but it seems like it's such a big machinery sometimes in some of these jurisdictions that mm -hmm. like um, a lot of things can happen and it's just very frustrating to know what's coming out of where and who has the power to do what. And one mm -hmm. of the things that I find it, that I find also very interesting is um, I've seen battles in the United States over who has jurisdiction over what things. Um, mm -hmm. and, and there's actually court cases on like whether one regulatory authority is supposed to do something or it's another one. Uh, you, you, I would say like um, it's it's easier to navigate that in, in in a jurisdiction like Mexico in other places in Latin America because um, it's it, it usually uh, easier to detect there's not that many folks trying to do um, you know things around crypto uh, sort of unilaterally you, you you mainly see these bigger concerted efforts to do things where various authorities are speaking to each other various uh, groups are sort of coordinating with each other and being the large player, you also become sort of like an obvious target for at some point some one of them reaching out and saying, hey, you know, this is what we're thinking. What do you think? And, and, and it provides you that ability to sort of remain very close to, 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 to sort of like the lawmaking process. The, the, but we've had our fair share of surprises. We've had our fair share of things that you know, we weren't expecting, no one consulted with us, and then they get published in, in some uh, place, and you're like, holy smokes, how come we didn't hear about this, right? Like, mm -hmm. it, it, I would say it doesn't happen with the frequency that I see it happening in, in other jurisdictions. Um, China probably being like the biggest case of this, where like, it seems like, uh, uh, you know, every few months there's a big new initiative or a big change in policy, and, and friends that are based in China are sort of like completely used to being in the dark until something gets announced. And then even when it's announced, you should take it with a grain of salt kind of mentality. Um, but, but, but I would say like government is government in Mexico. They see the, they have very specific mandates and they care about them and they will do as they wish. They will do as they wish and you might lobby and do the same things that uh, companies in the U.S. do. Uh, but you still need to do that, right? Like you still need to convince them. You still need to make your case. You still need to to do the the work up front, build the relationships, build the information flows, everything that like you know the, the industry is doing in, in, in these larger jurisdictions. Uh, two two more questions that that should be kind of quick ones. So so one is, what do you think the biggest misunderstanding or, or misconception is of, of the Latam crypto scene today? So so narrative versus reality gap. Yeah, um, I think people completely underestimate the amount of utility that uh, customers in Latam are actually utilizing for, 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 for crypto. Like you and I are part of a few Telegram groups where folks talk frequently about the narrative. Uh, like there's a narrative on, on some of these, these chats. And, um, and I'm just amazed how like 99% of those chats are dominated always by price action. Like that is the interesting thing. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's speculation. And, um, and, 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 and whenever you see sort of these like little things of like, oh wow, like this technology is actually useful for someone or changing someone's life or whatever, like there's very little interest. Um, uh, on those things, right? Like there's, there, I, I wouldn't say there's no interest, but, but there's, there's very little interest. And, um, and I think the way in which crypto really becomes relevant for the world is through use cases, right? Whether it's because it becomes a store of value or because it becomes a, a medium of exchange or because it provides a way to audit things more easily, whatever it is. But I think one of the things, it, you, you, we need to look at those, um, at those use cases 
and make sure that um, that the technology becomes useful for folks. Yeah, I, uh, I I agree with most of what you said. Certainly, you know, can appreciate that there's probably a gap and and you know, LATAM you, actual utility is, is uh, probably more prevalent and, and a more useful metric. I, I wonder if um, people like tracking changes, right? So when something's rising, falling, whatever the metric is. It, it, it captures your attention, right? So um, the way to think about it might be general investors only care about the price of the crypto assets because that's the only thing that they have exposure to or, or uh, really anything that requires their ongoing attention. Private investors, investors you know, on the VC side are going to read about or, or, or look at the volumes for Bitso and this new you know, payment quarter, uh, you know, dominance uh, between the U.S. and Mexico, and and they're going to get very excited for for the same reason. But one is, you know, a private set of metrics and and investability in the underlying equity of the company versus what's kind of broad based and, and accessible to everybody. So um, I think, um, you know, the, it 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 kind of seems like. Uh, the the price swing might be a good thing for kind of macro interest and, and audience building, even though we we hate some of the excesses <laughs> in terms of uh, like crypto Twitter and, and whatnot. Um, but uh, I I do think there's something to uh, even identifying the pockets of of you know real growth or or crazy volatility. Um, even in the down market, because that's where you can start to find. I, I'd argue this probably the area that you can find the greatest signal, right? Um, in, in the parabolic models, because everything goes up, um, and you know, a bunch a bunch of people feel like they're they're very smart and uh, don't realize that they were lucky, right? Um, yeah. But uh, I'm I'm uh, equally fascinated to see how you do in Argentina, uh, given the 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 the, the Inflation uh, and, and just the general economic woes that, that seems to impact the country every other year, unfortunately. Um, but uh, I guess we'll, we'll we'll take a wait and see approach. So so maybe this will be a related answer. But if you could change one thing about the industry right now, or could see one thing um, materialize this year that that isn't um, within your control necessarily, if it's so, what 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 is kind of a, a missing piece of the puzzle in your eyes? I, I've always thought that there is the, there's so much animosity in the industry. There's so much um, you versus me versus them. And, and I've always thought that the big challenge that the industry has is still regulatory. I still think that regulations can come in and do significant damage to the, for the future of this industry. Um, you know, we, we, we get invited to the Financial Action Task Force uh, private sector consultations. We've been invited since the first one that was held uh, a few years ago. And one of the most frustrating things for me attending those meetings is I've never been able to get the industry to act like I see the banking industry act in those same meetings. The mm -hmm. banking industry comes into those meetings and they have an agenda and every single bank representative is pushing that agenda. And in the crypto space, maybe it's because we're so young, maybe it's because, like, uh, as an industry, maybe it's because we're so um, disorganized still, maybe it's the nature of being decentral decentralized. I'm not mm -hmm. sure. But we're not great at lobbying, right? Um, uh, on the last meetings that we had, which were when we were, like, revising the travel rule, the regulators gave us an, an opportunity to come up with a joint statement as industry. Mm -hmm. And I could not get the industry to do that. We, we started an enormous uh, WhatsApp group with basically every single representative that was in those meetings. And, uh, and we, we, we just weren't able to do it. And, um, and I was hoping that maybe, maybe, maybe that was a result of like having very little time. But even after that, like, we can't do it. Like, the, the Financial Action Task Force in four months is going to look at the evolution of the travel rule. And the industry has done very little. Like, there's been a bunch of solutions that people have built and a bunch of stuff. But, like, we, we, we're not taking this stuff seriously as an industry. 
Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think that's going to come to the detriment. And, 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 and not even the, like some of the large players are sort of like getting together and like thinking about some potential solutions and that's great. And, 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 and they have some uh, potential solutions, but, um, but the industry is, is, is large, right? And you have players all over the world. And, and to me, it's surprising when I see a Japanese bank basically supporting a U.S. bank that's supporting a bank in, in Europe. But, uh, but you don't see at all the same with the crypto companies. Like we, we spit at each other and, um, and just can't work. And what, what you see basically on crypto Twitter when someone is, you know, um, very passionately talking about a specific project and hating a different project, uh, you sort of see the same thing with like industry representatives. And I'm not speaking specifically only about exchanges, right? Like I'm talking about, uh, you know, wallets, non-custodial wallets, exchanges, um, you know, blockchain analysis providers, like all the, we, we, we come up across to these very important set of policy of, of like global policymakers as like a set of kids running around, like a set of chickens running around with their heads cut off. And I think that's really bad. If I could change one thing, that would be it. Better coordination with the industry where we can come up with joint positions to lobby them together to help the, 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 these, these global policy pressures that we're starting to receive um, as an industry. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a fascinating challenge, and to your point, uh, you wonder if it's, it is even possible given the, the, the decentralized nature of the underlying protocols themselves, right? It, it, if this is supposed to be a little bit chaotic, uh, and, and, you know, uh, I think you have to go back to like early internet parallels. Who are the, who are the folks that ultimately uh, got the internet where it was today and, and actually fought for the release uh, and, and kind of public consumption of the internet? Um, preserve some of the, the kind of basic tenets of, of censorship or uh, connectivity um, and, and really allow that ecosystem to flourish. Because I'm with you, I generally think that um, short of a coordinated global response for, for at least some of the high level concerns, it's, um, you know, we're talking about people's money and we're talking about, you know, what people can do with that money and, and, and how they trace it for, you know, criminal activities and, and, and the like. Um, and you could argue that the internet had some of these challenges, but, but I feel like the, 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 the power of, of actually tying financial capital with this new technology is, is, is puts it in, in quite a different realm, especially these days, you know, post Patriot Act and however many wars and rise in nationalism, and populism and all that. Um, yeah. the good news though. Uh, is that uh, it's not all doom and gloom, and, and uh, it's it's incredibly exciting to see Bitso where it is today after uh, the last six years of, of watching you grow from uh, from a, a very small uh, seed idea to, uh, to to this you know blossoming international exchange and, and now a, a pretty major player in uh, one remittance quarter and, and hopefully many more in the future. So. Uh, Daniel, thanks so much for, uh, for, for joining for this conversation. I'm sure it's going to be uh, really well received by our audience. Uh, I learned uh, a lot, even though I knew you a little bit beforehand. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's great to get uh, some color commentary on someone that's actually in the trenches. Is, uh, his, his users are using this for things outside of rampant speculation. Thank you so much, Ryan. Thank you so much for the interest. Thank you so much for the invitation, for the time, for the thoughtful questions. And looking forward to speaking again soon. All right, everyone. Thank you, Daniel. And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Unqualified Opinions. Got another great guest lined up for just a couple more days. So uh, until next time, peace.